Welcome. My name is Morgan Hurley. I'm a fire protection engineer with Jensen Hughes. I've got about 33 years in the business. My name is Matthew Westendox. I'm a fire protection engineer at Jensen Hughes, and I've been in the business since 2017. And today we're going to talk about the use of occupant evacuation elevators and buildings. And before we get into the details, I'd just like to talk about the concepts of using occupant evacuation elevators. I mean, anyone that's been in a building uh, when the fire alarm went off knows that for most buildings, we're told not to use the elevators in a fire, right? And if you have a voice evacuation fire alarm system, the messages will generally specifically say, do not use the elevator. So there's a philosophical change of, okay, we can use elevators in the event of a fire, or occupants can use elevators in the event of a fire. And I also want to note that this is different from uh, for those who are involved in the details of elevator design. It's also different from what's colloquially known as phase two emergency in car operation. And uh, basically what that is, most buildings today have that. That's when the fire service takes control of an elevator during a fire emergency to uh, maybe use the elevator to carry uh, people or equipment to a higher floor or even uh, evacuate people with disabilities. This, this is different that we're talking about now. What we're talking about is during a fire emergency, occupants using uh, elevators uh, themselves to evacuate. Um, this is something that's been in the code uh, for a while now, beginning back in 2009, the International Building Code, which is, uh, you know, generally used as the basis for uh, most uh, uh, building codes around the country. Uh, beginning in 2009, the uh, International Building Code recognized occupant evacuation elevators as a means of, of egress component, but they're still uh, used as an alternative to as buildings got really tall, like over 420 feet, uh, as an alternative to the third exit stair that the building code required to get in those really tall buildings. Uh, but for uh, federal uh, buildings or government buildings that are under the control of the U.S. General Services Administration, they're the landlord for uh, basically U.S. government buildings, the U.S. General Service Administration began requiring occupant evacuation elevators in high-rise buildings that are taller than 120 feet, uh, beginning in the 26, excuse me, 2016 edition of their uh, requirements. So, so uh, when these uh, occupant evacuation elevators are designed, properly uh they will be used prior to uh the fire service coming to uh the the building and uh if one chooses to use them there are a number of applicable code requirements spread out among the international building code the National Fire Alarm Code or NFPA 72 and the and the elevator code, which is uh, the American uh, Society of Mechanical Engineers Standard A 17.1. Thanks, Morgan. That was a great introduction to occupant evacuation elevators or OEEs. Now, when we're talking about occupant evacuation elevators, there's a number of separation requirements and physical geometry requirements that we have to look at in order to successfully implement these. So the requirements for occupant evacuation elevators in the International Building Code can be found in Section 3008. And specifically, one thing to look out for is the one-hour fire-rated smoke barrier that needs to enclose the lobbies of the occupant evacuation elevator lobbies. This is something that needs to be highly coordinated in addition to the actual sizing of the lobbies, which needs to provide three square feet per person 
in addition to special sizing for wheelchair occupants, which needs to be for every 50 persons on the floor or portion thereof. Now, Morgan, this is something that will probably is not very well understood and needs to be coordinated highly with the design team. Can you comment on how, what's the best way to approach this to make sure it's incorporated into the design? Sure. So there's a couple things that one needs to keep in mind. And Matt, you mentioned that lobby. Uh, it has to be sized for three square feet per person uh, for a fraction of the occupant load of the floor plus these wheelchair spaces. So the lobbies can get uh, kind of large. So that's something to pay attention to. Um, there are these requirements for uh, what are called smoke barriers to separate the lobbies. Uh, those bring with them some baggage in terms of the kind of doors that you have to use and that if there's any duct penetrations, you might need smoke dampers. So that's something uh, to keep in mind. And then uh, there's also requirements uh, for uh, the doors to have what are called vision panels in them. It's just basically like a window in the door, right? So that the occupants can see in or out of that uh, protected enclosure. And, and so the purpose of those vision panels, Morgan, that's so that they can see the status of the lobby and see the capacity of it for occupants that are trying to go in. So you may have a stair connected to that lobby for people to egress from the lobby if they're not using the elevator to make sure it's not full or that's not already filled with smoke, correct? Yeah, that's right. I mean, again, we're talking about a situation in which there could be built, you know, occupants in a building where there's a fire emergency in the building. So we're just providing these additional levels of safeguards so that as people go into an area where they're going to hang out while there's a fire in the building, and in this case, it's this this elevator lobby, they want to make sure that they can see that that uh, is indeed safe to, to do so. Yeah, absolutely. And one thing that differentiates occupant evacuation elevators from your standard passenger elevators is the act of suppression omissions that actually go into this. So the sprinklers have to be omitted from the machine rooms, from the machinery spaces, control rooms, and the hoistways, because we don't want the water to affect the operation of the occupant evacuation elevators. Additionally, you have to prevent the water from actually entering the lobby or the hoistways from the activation of these sprinklers. So Morgan, how does an architect or a design team address the prevention of infiltration of water for this? Sure, that's a great question. And uh, on most projects, the way we have done that is just by uh, providing uh, door thresholds at the uh, doors that access the fire service access elevator lobby. So that's a way that if there's a uh, activation of a sprinkler that's outside of a lobby that it'll uh, protect against the water getting into the the fire service access elevator lobby and then into the hoistway. So that's the way that uh, we have done that. There are some uh, municipalities that want a little more than that, where uh, you may need to provide uh, basically drains so uh, this is a key thing that the design team needs to consider during the building design uh, while also paying close attention to any applicable uh, code amendments. Fantastic. In addition, there's a bunch of other stuff that needs to be monitored for occupant evacuation elevators, such as the lobby status. In addition to uh, smoke, there's also heat monitoring. There's a lot of things that need to actually be observed and monitored in the fire command center for this. So monitoring the power, the status of normal power, or alternate power, this is something that can trip a lot of people up. So it's it's important to ensure that this is being monitored correctly and the design team is aware that they need to provide provisions for this. After the International Building Code, there's also requirements in the Fire Alarm and Signaling Code, NFPA 72. And this is where we get into the discussion of temperature and presence of smoke in the lobbies, the machine rooms, the control rooms, and all the fun stuff like that. And now this should be monitored on the elevator control panel. NFPA 72 provides the guidance and requirements for initiation termination of occupant evacuation operation 
which affects the occupant evacuation elevators. And within NFPA 72, there are provisions to manually select floors to manually initiate occupant evacuation operation. Typically, occupant evacuation operation is initiated by a device such as water flow, pull station, smoke detector outside of the lobby, and that triggers occupant evacuation operation. Within NFPA 72 is the provisions to manually select it, and there is the requirements that the authority having jurisdiction will want to either append that floor to the active floors or separate out. So Morgan, in high rises, typically it's a contiguous block of alarm floors that occupant evacuation operation occurs in. Is this something that should be addressed early on to see if the authority having jurisdiction wants to have the manually selected floor be separated or to extend the block of floors? Sure. So that's a good question. And I think the key here is, again, this is something that needs to be considered during design, uh, not delegated to the fire alarm contractor and to the elevator uh, contractor, is there are some uh, specific requirements in 72 or NFPA 72, which is that fire alarm and signaling code that are different from what you find in the International Building Code, right? So if you're doing a uh, a uh, typical high rise fire alarm notification, uh, the International Building Code will say uh, alarm the 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 alarm floor, or fire floor, or the floor above, and the floor above. But now 72, if you have uh, occupant evacuation elevators requires that uh, we prioritize the alarm floor, the fire floor, and then two floors above and two floors uh, below that uh, so that those occupants uh, have the highest priority when they're using the occupant evacuation elevators for uh, evacuation. But this is something that's good to discuss with the local authority uh, during design, just to make sure they understand this as well. Absolutely. And in addition, there's the messaging within the lobbies. So NFPA 72 addresses the visual notification and the audible notification requirements. And then when we go into A17.1, ASME A17.1, we talk about the variable science requirements for there, the scrolling text or some other method of informing occupants that there is a, that we are in occupant evacuation operation and the status of the elevators. ASME A17.1 provides a variety of sample messages to be communicated and this is all occurring prior to phase one recall. So at the moment of initiation of OEO, there are three cases that need to be considered for the elevator. There's the case of the elevator's unoccupied and it'll proceed as normal for occupant evacuation operation. There's the case of the elevator's occupied and needs to halt and go back down or there's the case where it's occupied and it's already continuing to the discharge level. Well, I think, Matt, a key point that you said there is that the signage has to be variable, right? Yeah. So in 99.99% uh, of the buildings you go into, there's going to be a sign, you know, printed sign. It's a static sign. It doesn't change. It's, it's uh, mounted on the wall that says, uh, in case of fire, do not use the elevators. The key here is if you have occupant evacuation elevators, that there has to be dynamic signage so that what is displayed to the people in the elevator or the elevator lobby uh, changes depending on the conditions in the building. And, and Morgan, that's, that's also in addition to the sign that's changed within the lobby, the static signage has changed that has to indicate which elevators are suitable and are not suitable. Correct. That's correct. There still is some non-variable signage or static signage that just instead of saying do not use the elevator might say that, uh, you know, this elevator is available for occupant evacuation. And that's definitely going to be a learning curve for people is understanding that these elevators are acceptable for use during occupant evacuation operation. 
in addition, within ASME A17.1, there is provisions for additional hardware, such as group fire recall for banks of occupant evacuation elevators. So depending on how the elevators are arranged in the building, a separate group fire recall switches may be required per each bank for that. And so that's something that I'm sure needs to be discussed with the architect. What is the most efficient layout for the occupant evacuation elevators and the arrangements thereof? Because every time you're adding on a lobby, you're taking up additional space. So let's talk about best practices. Given how dispersed the requirements for occupant evacuation elevators and occupant evacuation operation is, it's beneficial to have a testing plan that summarizes all the relevant criteria in addition to on your drawings, laying out all the specifications for that. Morgan, at what point would you say is the best place to have a sit down and page turn meeting with all the disciplines that are affected by occupant evacuation operation? Yes, yeah, so that's a great point, Matt. Uh, this is something that has to happen during design. This is something that can't be delegated to the fire alarm contractor and the elevator contractor is to tell them exactly uh, what needs to be done uh, in terms of how the uh, elevators are going to work. Uh, so that has to be established during design. And then, uh, you know, it's important that when the building is constructed, then that there's a uh, test plan established that identifies uh, exactly how the elevators are supposed to work so that all the functionality can be tested, and that should occur as uh, early as possible uh, in the construction phase so the contractors are involved. And so Morgan, do you see the utility of having dedicated inspections for the physical installation such as fire doors for the lobbies or smoke dampers for the lobbies? Yeah, those are all things that are should be checked uh, during the building commissioning. So without a doubt, those should be included. And that's going to take a bit of coordination to ensure that the ceilings aren't closed in before that happens and ensuring that the doors are installed as they should per NFPA 80 and they're meeting the compliance of not only NFPA 80, but also the requirements of the IBC. Yeah, great point. And I think, Morgan, you brought up a good po a point about having a detailed test plan to isolate the cases, what you're trying to test, because chances are the team that is doing the testing may not have dealt with occupant evacuation elevators before. And so being able to break this down into digestible tests where you can isolate each variable and move forward one step at a time so you're not chasing your tail going back and forth. Yeah, and that test plan should be developed as early as possible because it's just going to make the contractor's job easier if they know exactly how the system is going to be tested. Uh, so I would prepare the test plan uh, long before the testing is going to be conducted. Absolutely. That's going to help align everyone's expectations and confirm that all the equipment is going to be provided that's required for either the IBC NFPA 72 or ASME A17.1. Yeah, without a doubt. So one thing I'd like to conclude with is that although we've talked a lot about code requirements for occupant evacuation elevators, they have been used in buildings successfully already and those buildings include the Stratosphere Tower in Las Vegas, uh, Patronus Towers, which are very tall buildings in Kuala Lumpur, uh, Taipei 101, which is in uh, Taipei, Taiwan, and uh, also the New World Trade Center in New York City. And for more information about these occupant evacuation elevators, you can uh, refer to Jensen Hughes website or you can find our full article in the third quarter issue uh, in 2023 of the Society of Fire Protection Engineering magazine 
fire protection engineering, which is available on the Society of Fire Protection Engineers website, sfpe.org.